Good morning. Welcome to Living Hope. Let's stand together. Let's start today in the Word. I'm going to read from Psalm 63 today. It's titled, My Soul Thirsts for You, written by David. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life itself. My lips will praise you. So I'll bless you as long as I live in your name. I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. I was doing a little bit of a study on worship a response, an outflow, an outpour of the heart. So I don't know what brought you here today, what brings you back to this place. I really hope it's not just showing up to see what that guy is going to sing today, but that it's an opportunity for you to connect with your Lord. So whatever it is you need to do today, maybe you need to Take a second during worship and confess a sin. Make yourself right before the Lord. Maybe you need to ask him to convict you about something. Maybe you just need to thank him for something. Can we utilize our time here for something greater than just doing church? That's my prayer for us today. Father God, we come before you today in all of your glory and of your wonder, of your power, of your might. We thank you for your mercies that are new each day. God, I pray right now for each person in this room that you would connect with them in a new, in a whole way. God, meet us where we are. Be with us during this time. We praise you because you're worthy. We praise you because we're in awe of what you did for us. You deserve all of our praise. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Only there is no one like. 
just when the heart is on the fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between where I used to be and it's reckoning I know I'll never be alone Why? There is another in the fire Sleeping next to me There is another in the water Holding back the sea Should I ever need reminding How I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden
every battle I know that's where you'll be You give me joy come every battle You'll be right next to me I count the joy come every battle God, we love you. God, we praise you. A God that walks with us side by side, leads us, guides us, directs our path. A God that realigns me from my sin every day. God, we love you. We praise you. You're so worthy. You're so gracious. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Uh, as many of you know, my name's John, and I'm the youth coordinator here. It's just wonderful to be here with you today uh, to just praise the Lord uh, alongside you. It's just so encouraging. It just fills my heart with joy, and I hope it does the same for you. I just wanted to quickly give you an update of, of what's going on with, with our students here. Uh, as many of you know, we're going to camp, and that's going to be July 5th to 9th, the whole week. So us leaders, uh, we need your prayer because it's going to be a long, hot week. And uh, we have about 20 students almost 23 students going to camp. And uh, it's just been such a blessing to see how God has provided the funds for almost everyone to go. And so as of today, we're just over $6,000 raised for our students to go to camp. So just clap it up for that. It's been a, it's just been so uh, just eye-opening to me. When I first started, uh, my own goal was to raise $3,000 to go to camp. And the Lord provided that. And then the next goal was, well, let's send 20 students to camp. And that was $6,000, and the Lord provided that. And now we're, we're over 20 students, and we're looking about to raise about $1,000. $1,000 is what we're trying to raise to send the last couple kids to camp. And so what I'm asking you today is to prayerfully consider whether you could be a part of that, whether that's $10, $20, $50, $100, $300, 300 or if you want to write the check for $1,000, that'd be great too. And so I'm just asking you to pray about that, think about that, be a part of what God's going to do in the lives of our students uh, next week. It's going to be so great to come back here and share with you uh, what students committed their lives to Christ, who rededicated, how many committed to ministry. I'm just so excited and just uh, prepared for God to do great things. And so I'm asking you today to consider to financially invest in us to uh, hopefully make it an impact for eternity. And so if you can't uh, donate, I'm just going to ask you to be praying alongside us and with us for our leaders, our students, for the entire camp. There's going to be about 400 of us there, just kids coming from all over the place, hearing the gospel, hearing that they're loved, and, and just knowing that, 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 that God sees them where they are, and he has an identity for them in Christ. And uh, so if you have any questions or if you want to find out more, you can reach out to me, uh, John Murphy. I'll be in the lobby after service. And uh, just be praying for us, and I appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks, John. Hey, it's good to see you this morning. Glad you're, glad you're here. Glad you're joining us online. Um, and uh, we want to have an opportunity to welcome you in particular. If you are a guest here, if you're new, uh, we want you to feel right at home. Take the opportunity uh, to visit our Welcome Center. There'll be somebody there after the service. You can connect with us through the cards that are in the seat backs in front of you or at the Welcome Center um, or you can go online at churchlh.com and connect through there. But I'd love to talk to you and uh, be able to know who you are. My name is Al. I'm one of the pastors here at Living Hope. And so we're grateful that you're here today. We do have a, uh, a free gift for you back at the Welcome Center if you choose to do visit that. But uh, we also want to let you know, for everyone, we would love to pray with you today. Uh, we have an opportunity for prayer every Sunday, whether it's up here at the front or back at the hospitality room straight across from the rear doors and you can just join us no matter what the reason just to be encouraged through prayer we'd love to talk to you we have a staff that um, usually hangs out back there and uh, waits for those that want to come for prayer so take advantage of that a couple things I do want to highlight uh, next Sunday is a little different it's July 4th so we expected that it's going to be a challenging weekend with staffing and with opportunities here in attendance and things like that. We don't know your plans, but what we're going to do next Sunday is to alleviate a little bit of the pressure here to staff things is that we're going to have one service, 1030. 
So uh, we invite you to come out. You're already here at 1030. Easy for you, right? The 9 a.m., I could see their faces like, oh, I got to come at 1030. Yeah, sleep in for another hour, and um, we'll welcome you here. But we're going to have hamburgers and hot dogs after the service. It'll be a family-friendly service. There'll be no children's ministry next week. We're going to give them a break, and uh, we're just going to be in this service talking about freedom from God's perspective. And uh, so we invite you uh, to be part of that and just keep that in your mind about the no 9 a.m. service. And then we have an annual congregational meeting we do every year around this time. We're going to be doing it on July 14th, the Wednesday night. It'll be streamed online and uh, also you can in person. And it's really to present our budget, look back at the past year, talk about the ministry highlights in a very unique pandemic year, and to be able to give you an update on things. And so you can come out whether you're a member or not and participate, and there'll be um, light refreshments. Um, I don't know if they're following during, or uh, maybe it's good to do it during. It makes it more enjoyable, right, the meeting? Um, but uh, we encourage you to be part of that. Hey, this morning, we have a guest teacher this morning, and uh, he's a little familiar to me. I grew up with him. He's my brother, Dave. And people were asking me, is he older or younger? I want you to guess. So anyway, he is a year younger, right? So, looks a little older, but you're younger. Anyway, Dave is the CEO of Esperanza Academy, three charter schools on two campuses in Hunting Park in Philly, and uh, Bible teacher, and uh, he's done a number of things and leading an organization there, and I just asked him to come, uh, coming off of my vacation, and said, why don't you come and speak on the 27th, and so we want to welcome him here. Let me pray as he comes up. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to be together uh, today, and uh, we are grateful for what you are doing, and we ask you to bless um, our time in Dave's teaching and as we take a look at this video. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. Thanks for having me. And I, I had joked with the prior service that Al actually called me last night. He wasn't pleased with his message, so he, he said, Dave, would you step in? So, um, so I, <laughs> I started an amen there. It might be the last one, but you, I got one. Um, <laughs> um, as Al mentioned, my name's Dave. I am the younger brother, um, and I look younger. Um, and um, I'm here with my wife, Stephanie. Um, and we have three boys, two in college and one in high school. Um, so thanks for, um, thanks for having me this morning. And um, as, as we do that, if you have your Bible with you, we're going to be in 1 Kings uh, chapter 18. We're actually going to do some in 17, some in 18, but uh, 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's pray as we continue. God, thanks for the opportunity to open your word. We know that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, God, so we look forward to what you have for us this morning. Use your word, as you always do, to move us forward, to strengthen us, to encourage us, to convict us, to do whatever you need to do in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And the video, as the video showed, um, I do work at Esperanza. Esperanza is a the larger organization is a faith-based organization that was founded over 30 years ago by the Hispanic clergy and Reverend Luis Cortez, um, who was part of the Hispanic clergy. And then that organization founded 
Esperanza College, Esperanza Academy Charter School, a cyber school, um, w welfare to work programs, um, housing counseling, all these things that Esperanza does. And my role is to lead the, uh, the charter schools, Esperanza Academy Charter School. Um, and I've been there for uh, over 17 years now. Um, the Lord has, has blessed us there. Uh, and as the pandemic changes, the way we kind of do our work, uh, they cha it changed things at home. It changed things at Esperanza as well. Um, this spring, early this spring, we became, I think we were the second largest or one of the largest vaccination sites in Philly for a period of eight to 10 weeks. Just as we were bringing students back into school, our campus was being basically taken over by FEMA um, and the city of Philadelphia. We were, uh, they were vaccinating over 3,000 a day there. Um, and it was, at that time, vaccination wasn't, uh, the, the vaccinations weren't as widely distributed as they are now where you can get them, you can go to the Phillies game and get two free tickets um, if you're vaccinated. Um, but, you know, then it was harder to get, so it was important for them to st strategically put vaccination centers in certain communities. So what a blessing it was to watch our campus be transformed to meet the needs of the community around us and really be a part of an organization that's adaptive, that basically does what it needs, what it takes in order to the meet the needs that God has placed us in the midst of. Um, a charter school is, it's a public school, non-sectarian, so you have this, this Christian organization, this faith organization that founded a public school. So that intersection of faith and public school coming together to operate a true public school, um, it's fascinating to be involved in that and see how God works in the midst of a public school setting uh, founded really by the Hispanic clergy of Philadelphia. So, uh, so thanks for having me. Um, 1 Kings chapter 18, and if you go back to 17, it's, it's the story of Elijah, and then ultimately we want to look at um, the, the showdown or the competition, if you will, between Baal and God on Mount Carmel, a familiar story to some of us. Um, but as we jump in, you know, when we go through life, we, we often ask ourselves, you know, why are we here? What purpose will my life have? Um, am I doing what God wants me to do? When we're younger, we often think of, you know, what am I going to do when I get older? What's life going to look like? Um, where am I going to live? What kind of job am I going to have? We have dreams and hopes and aspirations. Um, I remember thinking I was going to be a professional athlete. That never happened, um, as you can see, um, for various reasons. But, um, you know, we have these thoughts and these dreams and we have these hopes and fears and as we get older, then we watch how life plays itself out, and sometimes things come to fruition the way we thought, and many times it does not. And sometimes we find ourselves in places where, all right, God, how did I get here? Where do I go from here? And, and purpose and meaning in life is common, desiring that is common to all of us. I don't care if you're young, if you're old, what ethnicity or race you are, uh, what gender you are, it, it doesn't matter. All of us seek meaning and purpose, whether we're a person of faith and a believer and a follower of Jesus Christ or whether we're not. Um, Rick Warren wrote a book that, as many of you probably are familiar with, The, the Purpose Driven Life. It sold, um, you know, over 35 million copies, one of the highest um, grossing nonfiction books in, in history. The reason is, is because we all look for meaning. We all look for purpose. And and kind of stuck back in this book of First Kings, we are then given a window into this prophet Elijah and what he does, what he accomplishes through the power of God and the meaning and the purpose behind his ministry, his life, and his really his impact to really change the world, to change one man who was used by God to make a difference, which is something we all desire to do. So just want to read... Um, a little bit from 1 Kings 18, and then what I'll, I'm going to jump around a little bit. I'm going to start in 18.1. After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. I want to stop there for a minute, and I, I want to point out Elijah, this obscure prophet, if you were to go back and look at 17, it just says, Elijah the, Chish, the, the Tishbite from Gilead, it gives you no introduction. We don't know a lot about the man. He just comes on the scene 
and 17, in chapter 17, he comes, to, he comes to King Ahab, who was the king of the northern territory of Israel, a very, during a very idolatrous time. He comes on the scene, and what he does is he proclaims to the king, it's not going to rain. And you might think, how would this obscure prophet from a faraway place from Gilead cross the Jordan, come over and say to the king, king, it's not going to rain. And how can he have confidence to say that? The passage here doesn't tell us why he had confidence to say this, but the beautiful thing about, about God's word is scripture interprets scripture. You can go into other portions of the Bible to shed light sometimes on the passage you're reading. It'll tell you some things that the passage in front of you will not. The book of James, James chapter 5, tells us that the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. So the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. And then right under that, it gives you an example. It says, and Elijah, as, as an illustration, Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain, and it didn't. And then he prayed that it would rain, and it did. And you might think, that sounds like a strange prayer. Why would Elijah pray that? And then, why would he then have the confidence to stand before a king and say, it's not going to rain for years. It's not going to rain for almost three years. Well, Deuteronomy chapter 11 tells us that back in Deuteronomy, you don't have to turn there, but back in Deuteronomy, it says that um, it says God, God's speaking, it's the law, and he's, he says, if my nation Israel turns to idolatry, I will withhold rain. So here you have this prophet hundreds of years later knowing God's promise, living in this nation current day during Elijah's time where there's idolatry taking place and Elijah prayed and James chapter 5 tells us, 1 Kings doesn't, James chapter 5 tells us that he actually prays to God and says, God, withhold the rain. Why would he pray that? Because he knows the passage in Deuteronomy that says, if the nation is in idolatry, God says, I'm going to hold back the rain. So Elijah's simply saying, God, do what you said you would do. And so Elijah prays, and the book of James tells us that he prayed earnestly, that he prayed uh, in a way that was, was passionate, that in a way that was repetitive, that he went to the Lord um, over and over again. And the idea here is that he has a passion. Why does he want it to not rain? Because he wants the nation's heart, hearts to be brought back to God. Elijah has a passion. He has a passion. He sees the world around him not as it should be. He sees the nation of Israel following after idols, following after, after in this case, Baal. And Elijah steps into history and he says, and he starts with prayer. Not a plan. He starts with prayer. And he says, God, do what you said you would do. And so what does God do? Eventually God says, okay. Go tell Ahab it's not going to rain. Why could Elijah speak truth to power? And we find out in this passage that not only, this was a risky thing, because in Israel, Ahab and his wife Jezebel hated God so much that Jezebel was killing off all of God's prophets. And so in the midst of this oppression, in the midst of this persecution, in the midst of God's people being killed, this man Elijah has the courage to go talk to the king and tell him it's not going to rain. Why? Because it's something he prayed for earnestly. And God said, okay, now I want you to step up and tell him that. And if you look at, if you look at 17, it says, it says, now Elijah the Tishbite said to Ahab, as the, Lord of, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will, neither, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except at my word. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah and says, leave here and turn and hide in the Kareth Ravine east of the Jordan. So Elijah steps on the scene after all this prayer and says, and says to Ahab, it's not going to rain. And then God says, now run away. So that's all you're going to do. You get to say a sentence, and then you need to leave and hide. So Elijah, Elijah listens to him and follows him, and follows his word in obedience, and he goes to the brook Kareth. And there, God 
and you, you know the story, many of you there, God at the brook Kareth not only allows him to drink from the brook for, for sustenance, but then he brings ravens to provide food for him twice a day, every day. And, and during a drought, obviously, when he got to the brook Kareth, it was probably at, it was at the highest point it was going to be at. Because without rain, every day that brook was going to get lower and lower. The brook literally means um, carving or whittling is what, the, is what the, the term means. And I believe that God had Elijah there to carve and whittle him, to make him the man he wanted him to be in order for him to take the next step in terms of making a difference in the life of the nation of Israel. And so I can imagine him at that brook. I can imagine, you know, you ever been by a brook or a creek or a river? Um, you can hear the sound of it. And I can imagine at night with no technology and, and nothing around him that he hears this brook at night after he's, been read, after he's been fed twice that day by the ravens. And I'm sure the sound of the brook changed after, over time. I'm sure that the sound of a brook at its height is different. That brook started to dry up. The resource, the provision that God gave Elijah, after Elijah does what he asks, the resource, the provision starts to dry up. Many of us have been faced with that. We've been faced with a provision in our life. It could be a job. It could be finances. It could be a relationship. It could be the passing of a loved one where it dries up. What I once had is now taken away. And sometimes we actually watch it happen. Sometimes we, we watch it gradually as Elijah did, to see that brook get lower and lower. Whether, whether it's in our, in our life the same thing, we watch things dry up around us and we wonder, okay, God, what are you going to do next? And there's that fear that grips us. And why does it grip us? It grips us because it's so easy for us to trust the provision, to trust in what God gives us rather than to trust in the provider. So often, I think of the things that are around me, whether it's a job or whether it's income. God, what am I going to do if you take my job away? God, what are you going to do if this relationship fails? God, what are you going to do if somebody gets sick? God, what are you going to do if, if someone passes? And that fear of, oh no, what's going to happen? And what God's teaching Elijah is, enjoy the provision, but realize where it comes from. Stay close to the provider. And the New Testament tells us, you know, draw near to me. God says, draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. It's conditional. And when we realize who the one is who supplies us with everything we need, it puts us in a position where we can obey. Sometimes God says, you know what? I want you to leave the thing that I've provided for you over here, and I want you to go over here. And the question becomes, all right, how are you going to provide for me when I get there? And we don't often know that. And that's a scary thing. But when we are looking to the provider, that becomes less of an obstacle. But I believe we live in a culture, myself included, where we have fallen in love. The church has fallen in love with God's provision. And we've lost sight in many cases of the provider. And we trust in his provision without trusting the one who provides. And as you go through this, this brook dries up and, and God says then, all right, what I want you to do is I want you to go, in, in chapter 17, I want you to go to a widow with a young son, and she's going to provide for you. Now, he's in the middle of the famine, right? He's been at this brook for a while. It dries up. No more rain, no dew, nothing. And God says, okay, leave here, and I want you to go. And I want you to go find this widow that I've instructed in Zarephath. Zarephath, this was not part of Israel. She was not a Jew. She was not uh, someone who Elijah would have known. Matter of fact, Zarephath is the hometown of Jezebel. So go to the hometown of the one who's trying to kill you. And go to this widow. And common sense would tell you in time of famine, in time of drought, that the widow would be the most vulnerable. And so he goes there and he listens and God says, you know what, I've, I've instructed her to take care of you once you get there. For time, we can't turn there, but Luke chapter 4 tells us, Luke 4 says, in the Jesus says, in the time of Elijah, there were many widows in Israel. And Jesus says to the Pharisees, but I didn't send Elijah to any of them. I sent them 
to the, to the woman at Zarephath. And that just infuriates them because the idea is there's nobody in Israel that would take care of Elijah that would meet his needs. God had to go outside of that. Um, and that just infuriates them. But God instructs this woman, and we know little about this woman. He gets there, and you know the story. He miraculously turns flour and oil into months and months and months of meals. And so every meal they ate together, the three of them, Elijah, the widow, and her little boy, is a miraculous provision by God. And so what God is doing, what God is doing with Elijah is he is preparing him for what's next and he is making him understand. I'm going to feed you with ravens who the book of Job alludes to don't even care for their young. I'm going to have a widow take care of you who has nothing. Matter of fact, she gets there and he says, I'm going to feed myself and my son and we're going to die. And, you know, and Elijah says, um, well, feed me first, which I don't know how he had the, the that's, that takes more courage than standing in front of the king maybe. And, um, and you know, the idea there is that, is that God is going to provide through whatever resources he wants and don't focus on the resource, don't focus on the provision, focus on the provider. And Elijah's learning this lesson and he's learning it because God is preparing him to do something even greater, just like he is with you and I. He takes us through those times of whittling, those times of carving, in order to move us to the next step, and he has to prepare us for what's next. And the question is, in those steps, will we be obedient? Will we leave one resource or provision to go somewhere else? Will we trust in the provider enough to take that next step? I'm convinced when you and I get to eternity, we're not, we're not going to sit there and say, you know what, I should have taken less chances in life, and I should have played it more safe um, in terms of following God. Uh, we're going to sit there and say, you know what, what wasn't I faithful enough to the Lord that he would provide that he's asking me to step out and do in faith? And the whole, this whole ministry, Elijah's whole ministry was birthed in a prayer, in a prayer that was aligned with God's plan for Israel and for his life. And when that prayer and that plan intersected, stuff happened. The Bible teaches us, um, you know, as we said in James, that if sometimes if we don't pray for it, it doesn't happen. Jesus said, uh, you have not because you ask not. Does that mean we ask for anything? No. Elijah was asking for something that was consistent with God's promises, and when he did that, stuff happened. If you and I truly believed that prayer was that powerful, that if we pray according to God's plan in our lives and for the people around us, and we pray according to God's promises that that activates him, I think you and I would spend a lot more time in prayer. I think we would spend a lot more time focused on communicating with God and our prayer intersecting with his plan so stuff can happen, which is really what provides purpose and meaning in our lives. And as, and as we look at this, I think of, of this idea of prayer moving through. You know, I remember as, I remember as a kid, um, you know, going tubing or, you know, or rafting on the, on the Delaware. And, you know, you first get in, they, they drop you off at this nice, um, this, this nice calm place. And you're sitting on your tube. And you're going so slow, you don't even know if you're moving, you know. And you're just kind of sitting there. And then all of a sudden, you get to a point in the river where it kind of converges and it goes a lot faster. And when I, when I think about this idea of, of our prayer intersecting with God's plan and stuff happening, I think of that, that all of a sudden, the slow and boom, just goes. The whole river ride's not like that. But there's times when it happens where it just moves because God is bound by his promises. And we, when we ask him for what he promises, things happen. I remember when, um, when my boys were little, as I said before, we have two in college and one in high school. And one of my boys, when he was really little, really early elementary school, you know, the, the routine of, and of, that awesome routine of just reading the word before bed and praying. Um, I remember um, him bringing up the idea of, hey, I don't have a good friend. I, I'm, I really want God to bring me a friend. Or I just want a friend. And I, I said, well, let's pray that God brings you one. And 
you know, you have to be careful when you're, when you're talking to a child not to get their hopes up or say, hey, everything's going to be okay when maybe it's not. Um, and I remember thinking there, this is a, a great teaching opportunity because I believe it's God's will for my boys to have godly friends. I believe that God wants that in their lives. So I remember thinking right there on the spot, hey, let's just pray that God brings you a good godly friend and because the word says that if we pray according to what he wants for you, he's bound, he has to answer it, let's just do that and watch what happens. I'm thinking, God, you better bring this kid a friend. And, um, and so we, we did that um, and we talked about it. it may not happen tonight or tomorrow and it may be a process and we went through all of that and God did, he answered that prayer. And when God, God does that continually for us or in the lives of those around us, we start to be able to depend, rely, and, and know that God is faithful to his word. He's faithful to his promises. And that's an awesome thing. And Elijah's ministry was, was birthed in that. And, and as, we, as we go through, we see, we, see Elijah's, we see Elijah's process here going from the brook and the raven to the widow. And then the widow's, the widow's son, he, he dies and... Elijah brings him, brings him back to life. And her, her faith in God is affirmed. Her, and, and, but then God, at that point, he brings him through this process. And all of those things God is using to grow his faith. Why? Because he was willing to leave one resource to go to the next one that God provided for him. And he experienced things that he would not have experienced that he, if he hadn't followed what God asked him to do. What is it that I miss out? because I'm not willing to take that step? What is it that I might miss out because I'm not listening to God and he wants me to leave something that might be really comfortable for something that may not be comfortable? And, that's, and all of this prepares him for chapter 18 where we get to that, that portion of scripture where Elijah then goes and he confronts Ahab in, in chapter 18, and we'll just read a little bit, a little bit from there. In verse, we'll skip down to verse, well, actually, we'll go to 18. This is right where Elijah confronts Ahab, and Ahab says, Ahab says to Elijah, you're a, troubler, you're a troubler of Israel. In 16, he says, um, when he saw Elijah, the king, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? So he greets Elijah when Elijah sh is showing obedience to go and confront Ahab the second time. And, and Elijah says, I've not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and you've followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel and bring 400 and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Look at the courage. The courage to challenge the king and say, let's have a competition, Baal against God. And bring your 450 and your 400 to my one and let's see who God is. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, all the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Here you see Elijah's heart again. His heart grieves over the people of his nation, God's people that are wavering. They're wavering between God and they're wavering between Baal, which means if you're wavering, you're really, you're in, you're in idolatry because you can't be double-minded and be following the Lord. And he sees this and this grieves him. And then Elijah said to them, I'm, I'm the only one of the Lord's prophets left, but Baal has 450 prophets. Have you ever felt outnumbered? Have you ever felt outnumbered in this world when so much of the philosophy, so much of the actions, and, and Ahab says it best, he says, he says, you're a troubler of Israel. And Elijah's sitting there thinking, I'm a troubler of Israel? I'm trying to work on your behalf to bring this nation back to God, and I'm the one who's causing trouble? We live in a society where right is wrong and wrong is right. We live in a society where we feel outnumbered. That the ways of this world are so much more powerful than, than um, in many cases of what we feel in terms of the power of God. And, and at this moment, 
the deck is stacked against Elijah. 450 to 1. And then if you go down and read, and for the sake of time, we won't read through it all, but you have 450 to 1. You have Elijah saying, you pick the sacrifice, put it on your altar, and then I'll take the other one that's left. And then you pray to your God, I'll pray to my God, and whichever one brings fire on the altar, that's the God we should serve. That's bold. But again, why would Elijah have the confidence to make this public challenge? He has the confidence to make this public challenge because he's been through the preparation. He's been through the carving. He's been through the whittling. His prayer has been aligned with God's plan. God spoke to him. God moved him. God brought him to this point. He's confident. He knows. He knows. And he's speaking in a way that he knows God will come through. Later, we see in the passage that the, that the prophets of Baal, the 405th, they pray for hours upon hour upon hour. They cut themselves to where they're bleeding. They do all these rituals. They go through all of these, these strange actions in order to bring fire onto the altar. Elijah mocks them and says, where's your, where's, where's your God? Is he on vacation? Is he not home? Is he sleeping? Such confidence that he actually openly mocks the opposition. And then Elijah, later in the passage, go down to really what is, um, what is the, the axis of this whole thing, what it revolves around um, in, verse, in verse 37. He says, Elijah praying to God, answer me, Lord, answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back again. See, this is the bottom line. This is why Elijah got in this thing in the first place. This is why he prayed the prayer he did so people's hearts would return. He had a passion for the lost. And he prays this and he says, all right, God, do this. Why? So that people will know who you are and they will turn their hearts to you. Can I just say that's the same challenge for you and I? What does God want for us today? What is our purpose? God is still in the business of revealing himself so that people know who he is and their hearts turn to him. And the best part about that is he takes his followers and he says, I want you to be involved. I want you to be involved. God didn't need Elijah to make this bold proclamation on Mount Carmel. He chose this. Why did he choose it? Because there was a godly man who had a passion for God and for his people who relied on God's word in the book of Deuteronomy that says, if this nation goes to idolatry, I'm going to bring drought. And, and he do what you say. And then God uses that heart. And God uses that and he changes history because of a man's prayer. And so the question is, can one man, can one woman make a difference? Can one child make a difference? Absolutely. A heart that's aligned to what God said he would do, that is willing to step in and go through the process of preparation and not rely on the provisions that God provides, but to rely on the provider and to fall in love with the provider, God can use that man. God can use that woman. God can use that child. It's the same reason he sent him to Zarephath. He said, God says he instructed the widow. the widow. The widow clearly gave a response that said she would do it. God moves to those that are drawn to him. That's, that's why, as we said before, draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. What are we missing out because we're not willing to draw near, because we're not willing to step out in faith? And so the deck is stacked against Elijah and God more prophets, and then he douses it with water. He says, all right, I'm going to pray for fire, but before I do that, I'm going to chop this sacrifice up. I'm going to douse it with water so the water penetrates all of it. So much water that it, it provided this moat around the sacrifice. And only then does Elijah say, all right, God, do your thing. And so the hours of them cutting themselves and doing all of those things, the prophets of Baal, in less than a minute... Elijah prays after stacking the odds. Elijah stacked the odds even further. And God still came through. You know, working in a public school, 
you know, we've all heard the idea that, you know, back in, in the 60s when legislation was passed that really took God out of schools, out of the public school. Um, and, you know, the, the, the Christian community has lamented that. You know, you see things, put God back into school, allow prayer back into school. I've heard many people say, including myself, think the idea, yeah, but if we put prayer back into school, we're going to have to put all prayer back into school. The prayer of every false religion and every belief and everything. And then the idea there is, okay, so we shouldn't do that because we don't think God can compete. Well, you, 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 you have the odds stacked against God. He still comes through. See, God doesn't need a home field advantage. We think as believers, let's put people in office that are going to give us religious liberty. Let's put people in office that are going to do everything that we want to have done as a church, and that's where we're going to find our hope. God rarely works that way through human history. God works through Elijah's. One person, depending on the promises of God, willing to pray, step out in faith, follow God, and believe that he does what he says he'll do. That's what God does. He doesn't rely on elected leaders. He doesn't rely on anything else that we, prov that's another provision. He doesn't rely on all of those things. He relies on the person, or I should say uses the person whose heart is set apart for him and cares more about what God cares about than what I tend to care about on a daily basis. That's what God does. And yet we sit in this country where we feel like we need the home field advantage in order for God's plan to move forward. God's saying, no, 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 no. I do the best work when everything's stacked against me. And I pull people into that work and I use them. God doesn't, God's not a lone ranger where he says, I'm just gonna do it, you guys step aside. No, God says, if you follow me, you can be involved. You can be front and center. I don't mean front and center to get the glory. I mean front and center to be active so that when God draws hearts, to, draws hearts back to him and reveals himself, you and I can be involved. What a blessing that is. That's purpose. That's ambition for God's sake. That's meaning in life. And that's what God wants for every one of us as we move through. And then we see this happens. And then just to cut to the chase to the end of it, this great victory happens. And the fire comes down. Awesome, right? So, and, and then Elijah orders that the prophets of Baal are, are killed. And they are. All of a sudden, the guy who wasn't in control from a human standpoint is now calling the shots. And he goes to Ahab and says, oh, by the way, Ahab, it's going to rain. Ahab's excited. He evidently doesn't care that the prophets have been killed. Um, Ahab's excited. And, but then Jezebel, who was not on the scene, but um, Ahab communicates this to Ahab. Gets, uh, Jezebel gets enraged, and what does she do? She threatens Elijah's life. And what does he do? He runs away. He ran over 15 miles. And he's running for his life, and he sits under a juniper tree, and he says, God, kill me now. Enough is enough. You see the mountaintop experience followed by the deep valley. And haven't we been there? Haven't we been there when this awesome thing happens and then all of a sudden we feel defeated? And Elijah sitting under that tree says, I haven't even lived up to my ancestors. Why? How can he discount the thing that God did on Mount, Car Mount Carmel? Because I think in Elijah's mind, he expected that even Jezebel would turn her heart to God. That he wouldn't be chased anymore. That he wouldn't have to fear for his life anymore. But yet, there's still opposition because not every heart was changed. And Elijah sees this from a human perspective. He sees this as defeat. How do you go one minute boldly proclaiming the word of God to the next minute running scared, sitting under a tree and saying, God, enough, kill me? It's because Elijah's human. And what does God do? Does he respond? Does he wag his finger at him? Does he, does he punish him? Does he, does he try to lecture him? No, he sends an angel to nourish him. And as we close, God is with us in the preparation. He's with us in times of action, and he's with us in times of failure. And he still loves us. And he still has a plan for us. Because we find out, if you look at the New Testament, who was on the Mount of Transfiguration when God shows and reveals in a new way Jesus Christ? 
Elijah. I believe Elijah is in the book of Revelation. God has a plan for him in the future, just like he does for you and I. Whether we have victory or whether we experience defeat, whether we have failure or success as we try to follow after God, he will never leave us. We get to do his work and we get an eternal promise. Even to where in the book of Revelation it says we will reign with Christ. We are part of his future kingdom. We have a past, we have a present, and we have a glorious future. And the question then for all of us is, are we willing to pray in a way that activates God, in a way that allows God to do his work because that's the way he works, that's the way he operates? Are we willing then to obey when he does tell us to do something? Are we willing to step up? And do we trust him for our daily needs and for our provisions? Or are we letting all those provisions get in the way of what he wants us to do? So as you, as you consider this in your own life, there's a lot here that we've gone through. And what it all comes down to is what God is doing is he's working in the world to reveal himself so that people's hearts can change and he wants to use you and he wants to use me in that process. What's our priority? Where's our attention? And what takes up our time as we do that or as we seek to do that? Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for just the simple truths, God. Thank you for creating us, for saving us. God, thank you for wanting to use us, for allowing us to pray to you, to ask you to do what you said you would do and then to be able to watch it happen and to have, have us be used in the process. God, that blows me away that you would actually choose to do that in my life, that you love me enough to do that. God, thank you for our future. Thank you for the promises that you keep for us, whether we succeed or whether we fail. And God, I pray for anyone in this room who does not know the God of Mount Carmel, who does not know the God of the cross, Jesus Christ. And I pray that their hearts would be turned to you today, that they might want to know the provider and not focus on the provision. God, I pray that hearts would come to you even in this room this morning for anyone who doesn't know you. God, and for those who are already Christ followers, I pray that you would just rekindle a fire in our hearts, that we would spend time with you, praying for the things you care about, and then expecting you to do the work. God, thanks for how much you love us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks. Have a great week.